and again, if the I then takes the spirit body into itself, it receives the strong force, which it then uses to permeate the physical body. Of course, the part of the physical body that is thus transformed is not perceptible to the physical senses. This part that has been spiritualized has become the spirit body. The physical body is a physical thing is then perceptible to the physical senses, but to the extent to which it has been spiritualized, it must be perceived by spiritual faculties. To the outer senses, even the physical part that has been permeated by the spiritual appears to be purely physical. Taking all of this as a basis, we can now present the following subdivision of the human being. The essential nature of the human being 61. 1. Physical body 2. Life body 3. Astral body 4. The I is the soul central core 5. Spirit self is transformed astral body 6. Life spirit is transformed life body 7. Spirit body is transformed physical body. Agenda. It may seem that the subdivisions of the human constitution presented in this book are based on purely arbitrary distinctions between parts within a monolithic soul life. To counter this objection, it must be emphasized that the significance of this phenomenon is similar to that of the appearance of the seven colors of the rainbow when light passes through a prism. What a physicist contributes to our understanding of light by studying this process and the seven colors that result is analogous to what the spiritual scientist is for our understanding of the makeup of the human soul. The soul's seven members are not abstract intellectual distinctions any more than are the light's seven colors. In both cases, the distinctions rest on the inner nature of the things themselves, the only difference being that the seven constituents of light become visible by means of an external device while the seven components of the soul become perceptible to a method of spiritual observation consistent with the nature of the human soul. The true nature of the soul cannot be grasped without knowing about this subdivision, which is the soul body, life body and soul body, and has its roots. 62 Theosophy In the turn <laughs> Recognizing my spirit is true about the world does not pass away with 
a further result of these activities was the writing of his third as well confounding third as conception of the world which, together with his introductions and commentary on third as scientific writings, established Steiner as one of the outstanding exponents of third as methodology. In these years Steiner came into the circle of those around the age of Nietzsche. Out of the profound impression which this experience made upon him, he wrote with Friedrich Nietzsche, Ein Kampf für die Insane Friedrich Nietzsche, a fighter against his time published in 1895. This work evaluates the achievements of the great philosopher against the background of his tragic life experience on the one hand, and the spirit of the 19th century on the other. In 1891 Steiner received his Ph.D. at the University of Rostock. His thesis dealt with the scientific teaching of Fichte, and is further evidence of Steiner's ability to evaluate the work of men whose influence has gone far to shape the thinking of the modern world. In somewhat enlarged form, this thesis appeared under the title Wahrheit und Wissenschaft, Truth and Science, as the preface to Steiner's chief philosophical work, Die Philosophie der Freiheit, 1894. Later he suggested the philosophy of spiritual activity as the title of the English translation of this book. At about this time Steiner began his work as a lecturer. This activity was eventually to occupy the major portion of his time and was to take him on repeated lecture tours throughout Western Europe. These journeys extended from Norway, Sweden and Finland in the north to Italy and Sicily in the south, and included several visits to the British Isles. From about the turn of the century to his death in 1925, Steiner gave well over 6,000 lectures before audiences of most diverse backgrounds and from every walk of life. First in Vienna, later in Weimar and Berlin, Steiner wrote for various periodicals and for the daily press. For nearly 20 years, observations on current affairs, his movie books and plays, along with comment on scientific and philosophical development flow from his pen. Finally, upon completion of his work at Weimar, Steiner moved to Berlin in 1897 to assume the editorship of Das Magazine for Literature, a well-known literary periodical which had been founded by Joseph Lehman in 1832, the year of Curtis' death. Steiner's written works, which eventually included over 50 titles, together with his extensive lecturing activity brought him into contact with increasing numbers of people in many countries. The sheer physical and mental vigor required to carry on a life of such broad, constant activity would alone be sufficient to mark him as one of the most creatively productive men of our time. The philosophical outlook of Rudolf Steiner embraces such fundamental questions as the being of man, the nature and purpose of freedom, the meaning of evolution, the relation of man to nature, the life after death and before birth. On these and similar subjects, Steiner had unexpectedly new, inspiring and thought-provoking things to say. Through a study of his writings one can come to a clear, reasonable, comprehensive understanding of the human being and his place in the universe. It is noteworthy that in all his years of work, Steiner made no appeal to emotionalism or sectarianism in his readers or hearers. His scrupulous regard and deep respect for the freedom of every man shines through everything he produced. 
the slightest compulsion or persuasion be considered an affront to the dignity and ability of the human being. Therefore, he confined himself to objective statements in his writing and speaking, leaving his readers and hearers entirely free to reject or accept his words. Rudolf Steiner repeatedly emphasized that it is not educational background alone, but the healthy, sound, judgment and goodwill of each individual that enables the latter to comprehend what he has to say. While men and women eminent in cultural, social, political and scientific life have been and are among those who have studied and have found value in Steiner's work, experience has shown repeatedly that his ideas can be grasped by the simplest people. His ability to reach, without exception, all who come to meet his ideas with the willingness to understand, is another example of the well-known hallmark of genius. The ideas of Rudolf Steiner address themselves to the humanity in men and women of every race and of every religious and philosophical point of view, and included them. However, it should be observed that for Steiner the decisive event in world development and the meaning of the historical process is centered in the life and activity of the Christ. Thus, his point of view is essentially Christian, but not in a limited or doctrinal sense. The ideas expressed in his Das Christentum ALS mystic tacit in Dynasty and De Alterdom, Christianity is Mystical Fact and the Mysteries of Antiquity, 1902, and in other works, especially the cycles of lectures on the Gospels 1908-1912, have brought to many a totally new relationship to Christianity, sufficiently broad to include men of every religious background and full tolerance, yet more deeply grounded in basic reality than are many of the priests current today. From his student days, Steiner had been occupied with the education of children, through his own experience as tutor in Vienna and later as instructor in a school for working men and women in Berlin, he had ample opportunity to gain first-hand experience in dealing with the needs and interests of young people. In his Berlin teaching work he saw how closely related are the problems of education and of social life. Some of the fundamental starting points for an educational practice needed to the needs of children and young people today. Steiner set forth in a small work titled Dyer's Sunday Kinde's Song to Six Punctur Geist W. Zen Chap, The Education of the Child in the Light of the Science of the Spirit, published in 1907. Just 40 years ago, in response to an invitation arising from the need of the time and from some of the ideas expressed in the essay mentioned above, Rudolf Steiner inaugurated a system of education of children and young people based upon factors inherent in the nature of the growing child, the learning process, and the requirements of modern life. He himself outlined the curriculum selected the faculty, and, despite constant demands for his assistance in many other directions, he carefully supervised the initial years of activity of the first Rudolf Steiner schools in Germany, Switzerland and England. 